me to glorify his name. This week has been a very exciting week for me as, um, you know, the project of renovating the kitchen still continues. It's not done yet, but it's soon to be there. But we see the changes, we see the things that, that um, the people that are working in the house are doing. And it's amazing. It's amazing what these fellas can do with the tools that they have and the skills that they've learned. And I was telling Heather, I was making Heather, uh, I was um, commenting with Heather, and I was saying, you know, the kitchen that we're renovating has been a dream that we've had, but even when the dream is coming true, there seems to be uncomfort on our side, you know, that we can't, we don't have access to this, we don't have access to that, we have to put up with dust, we have to do all these things. And I said, you know what, in the spiritual, it, it, it's almost like that. When, when the dreams in our lives spiritually are coming true, it's not something that we enjoy many times. It's not something that, you know what, the changes that God has to make, the adjustments that he calls for us to do, they're not pleasant a lot of times. But you know what? The outcome of everything is going to be just a wonderful work. Amen. It's going to be such a beautiful result. And I was preaching about it last week, and I was telling Helen, you know what? We can see that when the kitchen is done, oh, we're going to enjoy it. But you know, in the meantime, we have to put up with a little trouble. But the, all the end result is going to be great so we can enjoy. The end result in your life is going to be great so that God can mm -hmm. find praise in your life. I'm going to ask you to stand up and sing with me. Come, Lord Jesus. Come into our heart, O 
Love you. I will love you. I love you. All of my days. 
He's the Prince of Peace. And there is no better reason for us to live our lives than for Him. Amen. It's one thing that I always like to remember. And I've been meditating on Sabbath message. And believe me, when, when, when somebody shares the word, I think that it is so amazing how it touches us first. And all week long, I've been striving to let God guide my steps. And all week long, I was thinking, you know, Lord, I need you. I need you to teach me, to show me how to live, how to make the right choices, to stop and think before I react, to stop and think before I make a decision. Because like I said, at times, we just, we just think so fast and we react so fast. And we're just so quick into making a decision that we really don't think about the outcome of those things. And one of the things that I was reminded about is the fact that I've been washed with the blood of Christ.
Nothing can put us back together again. Nothing can cleanse us the way we need to be cleansed. Nothing can make that powerful change in our lives, but only the blood of Christ. Glory to his name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. positioning satellite doohickeys that go in the car. You know, they're a, they're a neat thing, and, and my TomTom -tom is really neat because I can ask it, you know, to send me. Yesterday we went to King George, Virginia, and uh, we needed to go to 9100 St. Anthony's Road. And so I punched that address in, and sure enough, it took me. But the neatest thing happened. We were driving down 301, and a little thing came up on it, and it said, there's an alternate route that is 14 minutes faster. Do you want to take it? Heck yes, I'll take it. So I punched it, and it routed me around a lot of heavy traffic. All right, so it has a traffic thing on it. And boy, you know, sometimes it doesn't always come on when I want it to, but boy, I don't want to get rid of it because it has that traffic thing. It also has another neat aspect to it. It has, if you're coming up on where there's a speed camera or whatever, I get this beep beep. And there's a thing that pops up, you know, it says 500 feet to this, you know, red light camera or whatever. I really like that, you know? And, and uh, what I find is that even though I know where I'm going, like when we traveled to New York or to see Margaret's mom, 
wherever we go, I find that I put it up. Why? Because I put the address in and it tells me if there's a lot of traffic or if there's an accident. One day we were traveling home and it came up and says, one of the roads on your route is closed. Do you want the alternate route? Well, heck yes. I don't want to sit there for an hour and a half or whatever, you know. So I said yes, and it routed me around it and so forth. It's a neat thing, you know. And I don't know how we ever did without one, especially living in D.C. area. Because the traffic is always, right? Crazy. It's always crazy. Absolutely right. Well, two weeks ago, when we visited Falls Church, Pastor Elmer asked this interesting question. He said, what would you do if when you put your GPS or, or when you want to go home and so forth, and they tell you that you can't go on the route that goes by your home? What would happen to Margaret and me if they said we couldn't go get home by Excalibur Road. We just go to Mitchellville Road and you know. But what would happen if we didn't have those roads that we could get to? Well I got to thinking about that and right in the middle of that service as Pastor Elmer was talking about the GPS and, and how you know there's a lady inside that little thing that tells him where to go, how to get from point A to point B. And I wrote this down. It's the title of today's sermon. It's entitled, God's Perspective Saves. And sometimes I rely on my GPS to get me from where I start to where I want to be. And most times, it's, it's right on the money. There are times that I get off track. And this thing recalculates and, you know, puts me back on the right track. And I couldn't help but think about how the Bible does that for us, how the Holy Spirit does that for us, if we pay attention. Now, one of the things that I always do when I put the GPS, you know, up on the dash is I try to pay attention to it. Not to the point where I don't drive well, but to where I am and to how to get there. I'm always mindful of the twists and the turns and, you know, the, the roads that I'm supposed to go on. I couldn't help but think that that's the way that God's Word is. We claim that the Bible is our final authority in matters of faith and practice. Now, you know what that means? That means that for every situation that you and I encounter in our lives, that the Word of God has something to say to us to help us navigate all the roads and all the concerns and all of the problems that we encounter. Amen? Amen. I want you to turn to John chapter 8. I'm sorry, John chapter 10. And I want you to follow along as I read 18 verses, the first 18 of that chapter. <clears throat> Jesus says, and I know it's Jesus speaking because it's in red in my Bible. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his sheep, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. 
All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to rob, to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will come, become one flock with the one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Jesus trying to impart spiritual concepts, spiritual precepts to his disciples. They didn't understand what he was talking about, but he was talking about something that was very real at that time. He was talking about shepherds and sheep. And he talked about how the sheep know the shepherd's voice and they won't listen to the voice of a stranger. And in that chapter, he says that there is only one way into the sheepfold. And so we know if it is the true shepherd or a thief and a robber. Because the true shepherd comes in, there's only one way. I thought about that as I was thinking about what would happen if we couldn't uh, get to church uh, by using Enterprise Road. You know, if we knew that we couldn't get here, would we climb over the fence, you know, to get to church? What is it going to take for us to get home? Well, here it's, it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear that we have the good shepherd. And a good shepherd has a number of functions. And probably the most important one is to protect the sheep. To protect them from the thieves and the wolves. There are those that will come, Jesus said, in my name. They will claim that I am here, I am there. But don't believe them. I am the good shepherd. There are those who will maybe teach, try to teach a different way. If you look at 2 Peter, 2 Peter is about false teachers who come in and try to pervert the word of God. And there are some, we are told, that in the latter days, there will be those who will seek after those who will tickle their ears, tell them what they want to hear, what they like, what is comfortable for them. But in the end, it will bring destruction. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is death. So Jesus says, be aware. Be aware that there is only one way. There is only one way to get from where you are to heaven. Amen. It's through the door. It's through Jesus Christ. In that same book, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. And we say it with our lips, and we say, yes, we believe that, and so forth. But how does that work out in our lives? Do we take the Word of God as a GPS, for example? Do we take the Word of God and understand that no matter where 
what we've determined in our lives to do, that there are things within the Word of God that will guide us on that journey. And when trouble comes, we are aware of it because there is a danger signal that comes. There is that which wells up inside of us that says, you know what, you shouldn't be doing that. That's the Holy Spirit at work. And there will be many ways out there that people will say, well, you know what? You can have peace and you can have security by doing this, by doing that. Have you noticed on television all of the ads for those things which will help us lose weight? Isn't it wonderful? I saw one the other day that will help you get rid of Belly fat. Now there's something we always ought to talk about, right? Is, and you know what it is? There's this cream that you rub on your belly, and there's this girdle that you put on and so forth, and you wear it for seven or eight minutes, and it's supposed to get rid of the belly fat. In all my years of trying to get rid of belly fat, I've only found one way that'll do it, and that's push away. <laughs> Push away from the table, watch what you eat. Amen? Amen. Amen? Exercise. All of those things that we don't like to do. There are many ways out there that are given unto us to help us achieve peace. To help us, you know, security. Jesus says, I and the door of the sheepfold. I'm the door to protection. If you want to be fed, if you want a meaningful life, if you want an abundant life, here I am. Follow me. Follow my word. In Acts chapter 4, everybody turn there, if you will. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 10. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 9. This is Peter speaking to the rulers and elders of the people. If we are on trial today... For a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is, Christ is, the stone which the builders rejected, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is what? Salvation, Salvation in no, other, no one else. For there is no name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. Confronting the leaders of his day, the religious leaders, Peter said, Jesus is the only name given under heaven whereby we're able to be saved. What can wash away my sin? <laughs> Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. No amount of good works, no amount of good deeds, no amount of money that you put into an offering plate. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what saves us from our sin. There is no name under heaven which is given whereby men can be saved except Jesus Christ. Going back to the illustration of the sheepfold, not only is it for protection, at night the sheep would go in and there would be sheep from other shepherds in those sheepfolds as well. There were walls around that and it was done to protect them from the wolves. 
and the shepherd would stand guard so that if wolves came, if wolves tried to climb over the wall, then they could protect the sheep. We're given the word of God. We're given the Holy Spirit as protection for us. So that you and I would know what evil is. So that you and I would know how Satan works. So that we would be able to be aware of when a wrong idea, a wrong concept, a wrong teaching comes our way. That we can reject it. And we can stand firm against it. We live in a society today where more and more we're seeing this pull away from the concepts, the precepts, the rules of God. There are those people who are claiming to be believers, who are claiming to follow Christ, who, who say they believe in the Word of God, who are doing things that are clearly against the Word of God. And they're teaching others to do the same thing. You and I need to stand up against that. Amen. Rather than just saying, well, that's the way of the world. I think that the day is coming, and it is coming very soon. When true Christians are going to have to stand up and be counted. When they're going to have to stand. We're no longer going to be able to stay, you know, safely in our homes. But we're going to have to go out. We're going to have to confront the issues. Like we did in November, the issue of same-sex marriage. There were some of us who stood out, you know, and we went. And me, I was standing right next to a man who, wasn't a, who was pro same sex marriage, standing side by side, encouraging people to vote against, for, for and against. It's an uncomfortable place to be. But we're able to do that because of the protection of God. The psalmist said, What can man do to me? There's nothing that man can do to us to thwart God's working in our lives. That's the protection that comes. You remember a few years ago the t-shirt that said the devil made me do it? That's an out and out right lie. The devil can't make you do anything. The devil's a, thief, a liar, first of all. He's a deceiver. Amen? Amen? And the only way that Satan has any influence in our lives is when we allow him to do it. Yep. <clears throat> but many people don't know that a lot of these things coming in are from Satan. But Jesus is our protection. His word is our protection. There is no other name. You can't get to heaven any other way than through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The other thing that I notice in that 10th chapter is that he says that those who are my sheep, they will go in and come out and they will find pasture. I grew up on a farm and so I know somewhat about animals and boy, you know, you give, you give, we didn't have sheep, we had cows, but you give those cows a nice fertile pasture with green grass and so forth. And you know what? They will eat and eat and then they will lay down and be contented. Amen? I get that picture in my mind when I think about going in and going out and finding pasture. You know, what is it that we really need in our lives? Is it the food that we find on our plate three meals a day? <coughs> or is there something else that you and I need? Is all the food in the world going to make us content? No. Bring us peace or get us to heaven? No. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ. It's only his presence in our lives. It's only his peace, his security. His feeding us with his word. That gives us contentment. One of the reasons for using a GPS is to make sure that you're on the right road. You know, wouldn't it be a terrible thing to go 
try to get to King George and Virginia and end up in, you know, some other place out west in Virginia, maybe Winchester. Oops, made a wrong turn. The GPS will bring me back. God's word, when I make a wrong decision, when I make a wrong turn, the word of God brings me back. When I feel this, this kind of churning in my spirit. You know what I'm talking about? When things are happening in the world and you get, you know, you just get unsettled. And you get, you know, I don't know what it is. I don't know how to explain it. But there's trouble, you know. It's like the churning of a sea. You ever feel like that? Is there anybody here who has never been through that? What is it that calms us down. I've testified to some people. I'd say, you know, I, I watch the news and then I find myself just tensing all up inside with things that are going on in the world, you know, and I'm going, ha, ah, you know, because I want to do something but I don't know what to do. And then we will go to our devotions for the day. And invariably, there's a word from the Lord for me that calms my spirit, that feeds my spirit, that gives me that which I can rest upon and that which I can grow on, that which I can settle on. Amen? Amen. So that I can reach my destination. I don't want to get off the beaten path. I mean, the path that Jesus has laid. I don't want to go the way of the world if the world is not going the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. Boy, sometimes that's difficult. You know, I never really understood when, when Jesus said, you think that I have come to bring peace, but I've come. I will divide families. And you go, my word. He's going to pit mother against father, children against their parents, and so, well, how can that be, oh God? How can that be? Because, as Jesus said, there will be those who don't follow the voice of the good shepherd. And you know the reason that they don't follow him is because they don't know him. Because they don't know what his voice sounds like. I have been so impressed. Haven't always agreed with everything that's written in the, the Experiencing God book. But I'll tell you what. There's some challenging things in there. There are some things that make me sit up and take notice. Things that I knew that I forgot. I find that when I go into God's Word. I love the Word of God. I love the things it teaches me. I love the Old and the New Testament because the Old Testament was given to us so that we would have examples. Those are living, breathing examples of how the Lord worked in people's lives. It also is a living and breathing example of what they did wrong and the consequences of that wrong. For example, in, in Isaiah 35, verse 8, everybody just turn there real quick. Isaiah 35, verse 8. Actually, let's, let's look at this right from the beginning of that chapter. <clears throat> now, Isaiah is being given this word concerning the kingdom. And he says, in the midst of all that is going on now in the nation of Israel, anything that's going on with them, captivity and all of that, this is Isaiah's word. The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arabah, will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing in the shout of joy. 
The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord. The majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted. Strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come and he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute shall shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness, streams in the Arabah. The scorched land will become a pool in the thirsty ground, springs of water. And the haunt of jackals its resting place. Grass becomes reeds and rushes. And then he says this, a highway will be there, a roadway. And it will be called the highway of holiness. What does it say? The unclean will not travel on it. But it will be for him who walks that way. What way? The way of God. And fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go upon it. There will not be found there. They will not be found there. But the redeemed of the Lord will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return. A highway of holiness will be traveled by those who follow the Lord. No thieves, no murderers. They will not go on there. I put my GPS on the dash. And sometimes she tells me to go a different way than the way that I go. I know how to get there. And so I take it the way that I want to go. And I generally find that it works for me. It's something that I'm accustomed to. It's something that I have done before. Once in a while, I'll say to Margaret, let's follow, let's do the thing that the GPS, let's go that way. And you know what? I have mine set. I can either go the quickest route or the shortest route, or the shortest route or the fastest way. And I normally have it set to the fastest way. Sometimes I like to take it. The other way. Scenery is beautiful. I don't have to worry about toll roads or anything like that. But you know what? That wonderful invention that tells me about traffic is still there. I discovered this about God's Word. is that no matter what route that I am taking, if my ultimate goal is not to get to heaven, God will gently, ever so gently, try to pull me back on the right path because I really want to go to heaven. Is there anybody here that doesn't want to go? He'll do everything he can to bring us back on the right path. Now, we have the option. I mean, we can go any way that we want. We can believe anything we want. But you know what? When I choose to do my own thing and that GPS is there, it keeps reminding me over and over again that I'm going the wrong direction. That I'm not going the way that she has plotted out for me to go. The Lord does the same thing for us. When we get off track, be aware of that small, still voice that happens inside of us. You know, just that kind of questioning that goes on inside of us when we're not sure that we're making the right decision, when we are not making the right choices. And the Lord works inside of us. You know, just be aware of that small, still voice. Also be aware of that knock side the head, you know, because that's part of the shepherd too. 
the shepherd, when the sheep would be out and they, one would be running astray, that shepherd's crook would be there to haul the sheep back. But if the sheep didn't listen, he'd just whack them. And sometimes I'm like that mule that needs a two by four side. <laughs> Amen? Sometimes. You know, I need that small voice emitting from my dash. Turn right. I don't want to turn right. I want to turn left. And then that voice will say, go 500 yards and turn around when you can. Reverse direction. This is God's GPS and God's perspective saves. Amen. The question that I would ask this morning is who do we follow? Who are we following? Do we know the voice of the Lord enough that when he calls us by name that we follow him? And it says that. You know, that there are those who come in who are strangers, but the sheep wouldn't follow them because they didn't recognize the voice. How often does a voice have to speak to us before we become comfortable with that voice? If all we're doing is listening to the wrong voice, eventually that will be the comfortable voice. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? So God gives us his word to guide us, to direct us. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to pray today. <clears throat> We're going to pray for just that. We're going to pray that, that we will follow God's direction. And Kelly's asked that we pray specifically for that. She's uh, changing jobs next year in school. And uh, how long have you been doing what you're doing now? Seven years. Seven years. So there's a change coming in Kelly's life. Do you know what change? It, it, you have no idea. Okay. All right. So there's a change coming, and that can be unsettling. Amen? Amen. Change is always... I, I don't know if there's anybody here that likes change, that really embraces it. Remember this. Watchman Nee once said that the only difference between a rut and the grave is the degree of depth. I don't like to be in a rut. Sometimes that's where it's comfortable. It's what I'm used to, and so forth. But then there are those times, huh, Kelly, when it's just unsettling. And what she wants us to pray for specifically is for guidance, for wisdom, you know, for God's guidance. Whatever situation she finds herself in. That's what I want us to pray for today. Is that as you and I leave this place, as we go out, that we will look for God's guidance in every situation in our lives. That we will look to God's word. What would what is God saying about this? What would he say about this? God's perspective always saves. Where the one that comes in any other way is a thief and a robber and is only there to destroy. So we're going to pray. We're going to pray for Kelly. We're going to pray for others. But we're going to pray for each one of us. And, and I want you to do that. I want you to lift up your own voice and pray. I want you to talk to God. And then we'll pray together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, there is so much confusion in our world today. So many discussions about what is right and what is wrong. What is moral, what isn't moral. Mm -hmm. 
laws are passed, committees meet and, and discuss. We get into this uh, war of words, and it's unsettling. And there are so many voices that it's hard to know which is the right voice. In our scripture for today, Jesus said that those who know him will hear his voice and follow him. They won't, they won't respond to the voice of the stranger. We in this world today desperately need to hear your voice. Uh, the leaders of our nations need to hear your voice. Our families need to hear your voice. Every avenue in this world needs to hear your voice. Not some voice that says something other than what is in your word. Or, or something that is in your word that they have twisted to mean something else. The Bible is clear that there is only one way to get to heaven. There's only one door of the sheepfold. There is only one avenue that leads to your throne. There's only one avenue that leads us to heaven. And we need to be following that path. And you've given us your word, your holy GPS, to guide and direct us on that path. And whatever decision is coming our way, whatever circumstance that is in our lives that's calling upheav causing upheaval, uncertainty in our lives, you have a word for it. When those times come, I'm reminded of the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He told the nation of Israel, you told the nation of Israel. Through Isaiah, you may walk through the deep waters, but the waves will not overtake you. You may walk in the burning forest, but the fire will not consume you. There are always going to be those things that come into our lives that unsettle us. But praise God, your word is there. Your word is a foundation that we can build our lives on. Because Jesus is the door to the sheepfold. He is the good shepherd. Not only will he protect us, he will feed us. He will bring us safely home. And when we choose to go off on another path, he will come and find us and lead us back to home. So we thank you, Father, for that. We pray for guidance in our everyday lives, in everything that we do. And we pray specifically for Kelly as she's facing a change in her job situation. Whatever the job is, whatever she's called to do, Father, I ask that you give her your strength and that she be a blessing not only to you, but to every one of her students, whatever that situation is. I pray that. I pray for guidance into each of our lives, that the same might be true for us, that no matter who we encounter, no matter what we do, no matter where we go, that we will be a blessing, not only to you, but to everyone that we come in contact with. Bless our homes. Be with Cliff and Pam as they begin their travels again on Wednesday. Be with Laura while she's at this women's retreat and see her safely home. Father, thank you. 
Thank you for the joy that is ours, knowing that we have a good shepherd. Thank you, Father, that in your word, we have that guidance that lets us know what is a thief and a robber. When there is anybody who comes and says there's another way to get to heaven, they are a thief and a robber. But Jesus is the good shepherd. And he has come that we might have life and have it to the full. And so we ask your blessing today upon each one of us in every one of life's circumstances that we might bless you, that we might bless others. And we will thank you in the precious name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And amen. Hymn number 337. for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. 